enjoying the uh, last day of the expo. Welcome to our panel. My name is Amanda Cronin and I'm one of the panelists, but because I am such a good multitasker, I'll also be moderating the panel for the next 45 minutes. Welcome. Are you afraid of the mob? That is what we titled this panel today. But you might be wondering, what mob are we talking about? Are we asking if, if you're afraid of, you know, a mob of zombies on The Walking Dead? Are we asking if you're afraid of Tony Soprano and the Italian mob? Well, we're actually talking about you guys, an audience. More specifically, the fear of being in front of, speaking in front of, performing in front of a mob of people. So that's what our panel discussion is going to be today. You're going to get to, we'll introduce ourselves, we'll tell you a bit about our, our background and our own personal stories and overcoming the fear of being in front of people. And we'll open up the floor to some impromptu, interactive stuff as well as questions at the end. A couple notes, our, our panel today will end at 3.15 on the nose. And I think there are comment cards at the end if you want to give us your feedback on how, how the panel went today and what you took away from it. So statistically speaking, most people would rank the fear of speaking in front of an audience higher than death itself, which means that people in an audience would actually be prefer to be dead than be up here doing what the five of us are doing right now. So hopefully today when you leave, that you will feel empowered to start your journey to overcome the fear of public speaking and being in front of an audience. As I mentioned before, my name is Amanda Cronin. I'm a mother of two, and I, I have a super fun job in, as a TV producer for a marketing company here in town. And I have been empowered through Toastmasters and through the folks beside me here to get better at speaking in front of people and to get rid of my nerves when I'm doing it. So I'm really glad you're here, and I really hope that you learn from our panels, our panelists here today. I'll introduce our first panelist. He is the public relations officer for, um, and a distinguished Toastmaster, and his name is John Bauer. He lives here in Calgary, and he works for the Calgary Airport. I'm going to pass it off to him to give us a bit more information about his background and who he is. John. I always like to stand when I talk. I have a loud enough voice that I can, it can carry through the whole room. Like Amanda said, my name is John Bauer. I'm the public relations officer for District 42, which covers all of Alberta, Saskatchewan. So having to stand up in front of a group is quite come easy in the last year. Born and raised Calgarian. I don't like public speaking. I still don't like public speaking. But it's part of my, my role. And it's part of having to deal with clients at work. So that's why I personally practice my public speaking all the time. Amanda? Thank you, John. Next up, we have Terry Koslick. He's also a Toastmaster. He describes himself as a recovering introvert. He grew up in a small town where there wasn't a lot of opportunity to blossom in the, in the public speaking realm, but he has since found his voice and now it's hard to get him to stop talking. So if you help me welcome Terry Koslick to introduce himself. Thank you, Amanda. Well, I'm gonna hold the mic because I don't get much practice to use the mic. Yes, I grew up in rural town Manitoba, and I'm talking about several hundred people. So, in a small town like that, maybe a little easier today, but back then, there wasn't very many opportunities for a person to learn how to public speak. It really just amounted to like uh, shutting, uh, shouting out of uh, car windows as they're moving by quickly, you know, and usually not the best of words. Now, I imagine today in the schools, there are much better opportunities for teaching children how to speak properly. The only practice I got was in grade eight. We had, I think it was in English, we had a project that took, uh, I think the teacher gave us a week. We had to each come up and do a three minute, a three minute presentation, talk about anything under the sun. And that was it, grade eight. And you would think that, you know, come grade 10, 11, and 12, when students are shaping their, their careers, thinking what to do next, that speaking would be a big part of it. And, and now my wife dreads when somebody asks me a question. <laughs> so I'm very self-conscious about it. In fact, she's always sitting on my shoulder here. Every time I open my mouth, I see her say, okay, that's enough, let someone else talk. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Terry. Our next panelist 
is Robert Litwin. He's a self-proclaimed geek. He definitely knows his way around conventions like this. He's the president of a Toastmasters club. He's a second officer of a Star Trek club. And he's also very involved as a volunteer for Vulcan Tourism. Help me welcome Robert to introduce himself, please. Well, thank you very much, Amanda. As uh, she said, I'm a self-proclaimed geek extraordinaire. As you can see, I've got my geek on. I was given this t-shirt as a way for my family to tell me that my life was ruined by video games. I chose to take it a different way. I got two extra lives, and, every, and I choose to use it as a way to empower me. I also didn't realize the life lesson of how to empower yourself until probably about four years ago in my job, where we had a group of 100 people from all over the company in a room, and I just realized that I'm such a geek, but I was hiding it, and I wasn't using it to its full potential. So now I let my geek flow into everything I do, and it gave me the confidence to be and do what I'm doing now, and I haven't stopped looking back since. And this is the way that I conquered my fear of public speaking and got out into the world myself. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Robert. And our final panelist today is Ron Friedman. Ron is an award-winning science fiction author, and he, he's also a Toastmaster. Oh, I just drew blanks. <laughs> he, he attends comic conventions like this a lot, and he has a lot of experience on panels and moderating and speaking in front of people. Ron, what else can you tell us about yourself? Yeah, thank you. I'm not entirely sure I have a lot of experience talking in front of the audience. You're all very scary people. Yeah, I'm a science fiction writer. Uh, this is my latest short story. It was published in Galaxy Edge. It's an American magazine. It's going to be translated to Chinese. A uh, really cool author there, like all the Heinlein and other stuff. I'm also editing an anthology right now, a science fiction short story collection, which we will see the light in August. I published a few other short stories. Uh, not yet a novelist. I finished novel, but I'm unable to sell it as of yet. Uh, story. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, 18 years ago in university, I had to give a project uh, and I need to speak about it in front of an audience. And I was, uh, I, I completely went blank for a few minutes and then I managed to somehow very inconfidently go through it and present it. And then a few years later I immigrated to Canada and I had to speak in a diff completely different language. So imagine how complex this is. So Toastmasters and other opportunities did uh, really well for me. So thank you very much. And thank you, Ron. All right, before we get to the interactive part of the session today, I thought we'd talk to the panelists and ask um, for their own personal stories and their journey of how they got here, and maybe even offer up some tips, things that have worked for them when it comes to public speaking and how to overcome their fear. And I'll start off with myself. Um, unlike Terry, who describes himself as a recovering introvert, I describe myself as a reborn extrovert. When I was a teenager in high school, I was, I was the drama kid. I loved doing monologues in front of people. I loved being on stage and entertaining people. But then jump ahead to being married with kids and I'm returning to work after my second mat leave. And for whatever reason, I couldn't figure out why, but my confidence was shattered. And I was in this weird rut at work where the fear of getting up in a meeting to do a presentation or having a boss ask me a question in front of people, I would get that physical reaction where my teeth would start sticking to my mouth and my mouth would be dry and I'd be shaking and I, and I couldn't understand what was becoming of me because when I was young I was so good at being in front of people. So then I started looking for people who were struggling like me and I found Toastmasters. And I went to a club and I found other people who were trying to get better, who were supportive, who gave me feedback, and slowly I started to become that extrovert that I remembered I was when I was younger. And I hope that you guys reach out and look for a Toastmasters Club because it is a wonderful place to be. When it comes to public speaking, I always use the metaphor of swimming. Someone who is terrified of the water, the only way to overcome that fear is to learn how to swim. And the only way to learn how to swim is if you're willing to get wet. And the same thing applies to public speaking. To get better at it, you need to seek out the opportunities to get in front of people and to practice your skills. 
and slowly the nerves go away, slowly you learn how to channel that nervous energy into something fun. That's my personal story, now we'll pass it off to, to John and maybe you can give us some thoughts and tips. Thank you, man. For me, public speaking came a lot in work. I, um, I started out my working career as a project administrator and contract admin in an architectural firm and stepped onto a construction site not knowing how to speak to the guys properly to get them to do what you're telling them to do in paper. So then my boss said, you need to do something. I tried Dale Carnegie, it's a great course if you have $2,000 to spend over 12 weeks. By coming to Toastmasters actually helped me a lot more because it's not only the public speaking and getting the feedback, it's the positive feedback that I got. I now can sit and lead four or five hour meetings which are on a regular basis for me at the airport just to get people and express my idea across to them and express what I need them to do. It's not easy, you can even say your idea, but saying it in such a way that you get people to want to do what you're asking them to do or your idea. The biggest thing I found with Toastmasters is it helped me cut out a lot of grammatical errors in my speech. The connector words, the ums, ahs, ands, and so's. When I started Toastmasters now three years ago, in a two minute speech I had 46 ums, ahs, ands, and so's in two minutes. It's still my club's record. <laughs> They're trying to beat it. Closest person's come to 43. I've told whoever beats it, I'll take them out for a steak dinner if they can actually beat it. <laughs> and they're actually purposely trying to do it. But it grains into you that connecting words aren't part of your language anymore. It's knowing where to use them, where not to use them. The other thing that public speaking has helped me quite a bit is my own self-confidence. Being able to stand up in front of a group, I can do now. I've always been able to lead groups, and for me, they were military groups. I tell them what to do, they do it. It's different when you're not in the military or in an organization like that. It's not that simple. It's helped me out with job interviews, big time. Has it ever helped me out with job interviews? The last two jobs I've gotten are because I've been a part of Toastmasters. And that's the exact words that the people in the interview have said. So don't be afraid to realize that, hey, I can speak, I can stand up in front of a group, but it's being able to structure your speech in such a way that makes sense, and being able to portray your idea and get the buy-in, the feedback. Because any of the feedback I've gotten has always been positive. Even though there's things in there that I can improve on, they always come back in a positive way and make you think, go, oh, yeah, I can change that. So. Look into it for sure, speak to us afterwards, they're more than willing to help anybody out. And I even still learn new things every day from people, so thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, that's a really good perspective on how Toastmasters can help you in your career, in your profession, and your you know, your day-to-day -day career development and growth. Terry, what perspective do you have? You're a recovering introvert. Maybe you can tell us more about your personal journey. Well, when I was growing up, and if my father was still around, if you could ask him, he would say I was anything but an introvert. When I was small, I used to drive him crazy. I used to ask him questions on, how does this work? Why is this? Why is that? And a lot of times, out of frustration, he'd say, how do I know? How do I know? Stop asking me these questions. Well, as I got a little bit older, I was in my early teens, my father started saying something uh, a little more significant to me. He used to say, if you're going to babble, make sure it's something of value to somebody. And I think that was a sign that something good was eventually going to happen, that I see the, the, uh, the urgency, the importance of learning how to speak well, even if you're just asking somebody for directions. When I graduated and started working, one of the things that also hit me on the head one day was how well, a person stands out above everyone else that, that you meet, whether it's at work, whether it's socially, how much more they stand out when they speak well. And they don't have to speak a lot, but it's the eye contact, it's the accentuation, it's the smile, it's the presentation. 
And I started to realize that being able to speak is such a quick way to gain someone's attention. You stand out above everyone else. And slowly I started to see the importance and the urgency, uh, the need for somebody to learn how to, to speak well, how to converse with, with others. Now today there's an extra, extra challenge I'm starting to see, and many of you have probably seen this already. Because of texting, because of the information age, the internet, people are losing their ability to write proper sentences. And I think it's because initially there was just email. And then came texting, and I still don't know what the big, what the big value of texting is. I dislike it because it's, it's, like, it's like putting a speed bump on the information highway. You can speak to somebody and transmit so much information. Try to do that texting, and I'm not that fast. But my daughter says texting is the next big thing. It's, it's so great. And it's because of that that also our attention span is getting shorter and shorter. You have to gain someone's attention that much faster today because their attention span is that much shorter. We've become a little more impatient. And I just look at myself sometimes. Why am I so impatient? It's only taking five seconds more. And it's because of this internet age, because we're, we're spending so much time on browsers, uh, for example, that we want it instant. And just because it's five seconds longer doesn't mean it's, it's any worse. So I think that today means that we have to still keep up and focus on being able to speak well and to connect with people, whether it's eye contact and also to listen well. The communication, it's two ways. So I think now more than ever, we really need to make sure that our speaking skills are up to par. And it's a never ending. It's, you're never done in a day, a week, a year. It's a constant. It's, it's your soft skills that has to be constantly maintained. I mean, how much time do we spend time shopping, cleaning our cars, cutting the grass? But how much time do we spend on our own personal maintenance, aside from maybe proper clothing and, and being nicely dressed and groomed. We don't spend enough time on that, so I think, I think public speaking is a great thing to spend time in. Thank you, Terry. You know, good point, for sure. I think your daughter's right, though, texting is totally important. <laughs> but you're right, it means because we're online and we're communicating electronically so much, having that face-to-face -face time and making sure that that time matters is really important. Thank you, Terry. Robert, our self-proclaimed geek, what do you want to tell us about your journey in public speaking and how it's helped you? Well, as I said earlier, it really helped me to realize that I shouldn't be afraid of who and what I am. I was always a closeted geek. I was a loner as a kid and everything like that. I was actually even suicidal at one point. I went into school every day for a week telling everyone I was going to off myself all day, every day, for a whole week. I actually shared this experience with the group of 100 people at work. And as soon as I did that, I also realized the only time I was confident when I was talking about video games, movies, anything geek related. I actually joke nowadays that I have a wireless link to the international movie database. My friends hate me so much at movies because I'll be sitting there, I'll see an actor on the screen, and I'm just like, I love that actor from this movie and this movie. And they're just like, dude, shut up, you're ruining the movie for me. But I realize that this is my strength. It's where all my energy comes from. And in order to be a good leader or to be a good person, period, to, to be able to communicate, to be a leader in anything, you need to have that confidence. So I take all that energy from all this geek stuff and I channel it into everything. So, for instance, one of the first times Amanda ever came to a Toastmasters meeting, I did a five to seven minute speech and gave the entire history of the new Battlestar series from start to finish. And I hooked her just like that because she was like, what, you're talking about Battlestar in a Toastmasters club? Like, wow. And we probably wouldn't have her here if it wasn't for that. I, I could be wrong about that, I don't know. But the point is, don't be afraid of who you are. Just channel everything you can from what you're good at into everything you do. 
And that's why I'm now working so hard with Falcon Tourism. Started this Star Trek club in less than a year, going to all these cons. I moderated a panel here, and you know I'm going to continue to let the geek flow for all eternity because that's where my energy comes from. And if you can't express what you're doing or what your passion is, you're really not living up to your full potential. And that's what you got to do is just harness that energy and keep it going full force. Thanks, Robert. You're right. It's all about building your confidence, and channeling your passions. Who knows, maybe there'll be a Battlestar Galactica panel next year and Rob will be moderating it. You never know, right? Ron, what do you want to tell us about your personal journey? I know you moved here from Israel, so maybe that's something you want to talk about. Yeah, I moved uh, here from Israel about 12, nearly 13 years ago. And uh, uh, I, actually, I want to talk a little bit about yourself. Who is here an actor or creator or inspired actor? Inspired public speaker. I'm a teacher. A teacher, nice. so you probably should join us. Yeah. Hey, Ron, I think we had a Toastmaster way back in the corner here. <laughs> <laughs> and who just wants to do a good interview next time you have a job interview? Nobody. Oh. <laughs> so, so this is really, really something that you do want to improve uh, your abilities and your speaking skills. Uh, I want to give you two tips that I learned in my uh, two decades of uh, experience. First one is always try to step outside your comfort zone. Like if you are afraid of public speaking, afraid of standing in front of the audience, jump right in, try to do something, and very, very soon I'm going to actually give you the opportunity to do that. And the other thing is don't listen for people who tell you what you can't do, because then you really can't do that. I can give you a couple of examples. I started writing in 2005, before that I was a gamer, and then my wife told me no more games for you, so can I write science fiction? Okay. So I started to write some science fiction, and I started sending it to publishers, and, uh, and I got really, really initially very negative responses. One even went as far as, you have no business writing. Uh, because English is my second language, and I sent a cover letter that was very apologetic. Excuse me for submitting English, excuse all my error, my English is my second language, I was re and this is did quite well. And the editor actually thought she, she was uh, giving, doing me a favor, but giving me an advice, don't waste your time, do something better with your life. But I didn't listen. Another example is uh, from a family event. Uh, my wife, uh, I'm from Israel, so the family event is a uh, bar mitzvah. So normally uh, all the family members uh, are supposed to read something, Oh, I congratulations to this one, I welcome, best wishes. And normally they're reading in from a note and cry. I came and I started with a joke, oh, I forgot my notes. And then I went and started, it was before Hanukkah, so I started to do a speech about Hanukkah, about the Greeks and the Romans. And when I showed this speech before the promise to my wife, she told me, don't do that, it's very, very bad. But as uh, the advice I'm giving you, I simply ignored her. And everybody, including the rabbis and all the other guests, came after her and said, wow, that was really a nice speech, really speech. You could be the rabbi yourself. I'm not really religious, but... <laughs> Step outside your uh, comfort zone and don't listen to naysayers or people who try to reduce your confidence. Just don't do that. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> and there's 15 minutes left to the panel, and we want to make sure there's time to answer questions and to also do the interactive portion that we talked about earlier. But before I do that, I'm going to hand the mic over to John Bauer, who wants to give a few words on Toastmasters in general, because he is our PR officer and stage Toastmaster. So some of you guys are probably asking, you've heard us talk about Toastmasters, and you're probably wondering, what is it? It is communication and leadership skills building. There's two sides of it. How many people here have had bosses that they don't know how to communicate to? Right? How many people here have had great leaders that know how to communicate to their boss, to their people? I've had both. So Toastmasters just gives you the mechanism to be able to do that. We have two manuals that we use that start out and then you get into more advanced technical presentations. Then there's a leadership track which is where I am. I practice more of my leadership stuff than I do my communication. But they go hand in hand. 
So feel free to ask us afterwards more, even more questions about Toastmasters because it's for the price that you pay for it and there's clubs just in downtown Calgary alone, there's over 100 clubs just in downtown Calgary. And in the city there's over 120. So feel free to ask us questions about it afterwards. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like Tara, I'd just like to practice with the microphone because how often do you get to practice with the microphone? So next up, we're going to do uh, a portion, a section that we're going to call impromptu speaking. So this is, in a Toastmasters meeting, the chance where members would get up and practice impromptu speaking like you would, say, at a dinner party where you're having to make small talk or in a job interview in a corporate setting. Every day when you think about it, we're always having to impromptu speak and say things that we didn't plan on saying. So to introduce that and to run that section of the meeting, I'll call up Robert. And how it'll work is he'll read out the topic, and if someone wants to come up and just try and speak for two minutes about that topic, but I'll let it go. First off, I don't want to throw you guys to the wolves right away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give an example. Uh, Terry has graciously uh, volunteered to answer a question. So what I'm going to ask Terry is. You're stuck in an elevator with your boss, and you're going up to the 42nd floor from the lobby. What would you say, or how would you approach a conversation with him so you're not hearing crickets chirping in the elevator for the whole tour? Well, that's that's rather interesting because some of the some of the bosses I've had in the past are not people who are comfortable with someone in the elevator, a coworker like me, asking them a question. So. It may be just the crickets going up. Well, I'm assuming that it's uh, a boss in my immediate group. Uh, probably I would stick to something work-related. Uh, depending how well I know them, I would probably ask them to elaborate something about the current project. Uh, remembering, of course, that you don't want to put them on the spot. The elevator time, you don't want to ask them a detailed question where it takes a 10 minute answer, and sometimes even the weather or the weekend might be something good to talk about. And that's something that a lot of people do. They talk about the weather, and I think that's just a mild way of breaking the ice and speaking to, uh, conversing with somebody, just talk about the weather. It is a bit overplayed because everybody's heard the, the, the skit so much, but I, I'd probably just stick to something simple like that. Okay, so basically what it is, I just hit him with a question that he wasn't expecting out of the blue, and the whole point of this exercise is to get you to think outside of your comfort zone, get comfortable with just on-the-spot thinking. Now, of course, we're at a convention, so a lot of the topics I'm going to maybe bring up are convention-related. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see any real branding in the audience for any particular genre. I was really hoping that there would be like a Star Trek fan or, or something. Oh, we do have some Star Trek fans. Oh, yeah. So the first question I'm going to pose is, which universe is better? The Star Wars universe or the Star Trek universe? Now, I'd like someone to come up and just speak to the topic for as long as you can, up to two minutes, if possible. Uh, I'm going to try. Hi. <laughs> uh, the reason why I think the Star Trek universe is far more compelling than the Star Wars universe, um, the, the, for, for me at least, the question or the answer is twofold. Uh, for one, Star Trek, in my opinion, is much more egalitarian. In Star Wars, you have people who are preordained, or people who are expected to fill a certain prophecy or to fulfill a certain like expectation and they often rise to, and fulfill that. And the problem I find with that is that it basically leads a whole cast of individuals who have no actual hope or who no actual, like, no actual uh, means to kind of rise above their, their, their way of being and the way of life. Whereas I find in the Star Trek, uni or Star Trek universe, sorry, there are people who come from all sorts of backgrounds who might not necessarily have like a preordained amount of midi-chlorians in their system, but people who, through hard work, perseverance and dedication end up in the position that they're in through their own hard work. They're pulling themselves out by their bootstraps. That's kind of what I like, what I, what I prefer to it at any rate. 
Uh, also, what I also prefer about it is that it's also a reflection of what we could possibly be. It's a little naive, possibly a little utopian. It, it, it is, sorry. Maybe with the exception of DS9, but it's definitely something that we can maybe even achieve and kind of look forward to. That's my opinion at any rate, so, yeah. Are you a Toastmaster? No. Was that topic maybe a little too easy? <laughs> All right. Now, I can't tell. Is that like a Jurassic Park so spoof on? Evangelion slash Jurassic Park. Oh. Yeah. That's what the Freudian influences of Evangelion. <laughs> Would you care to come up and decipher what exactly that shirt means? No. I won't be on the spot for that, but... It's Go for it. You want Unless it. you want it. Uh, maybe not an Evangelion topic. I don't know. Oh, it should be another one. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll go with something a little easier. Um, everybody here, of course, loves Super superheroes. They have someone who's influenced their life or given them something to dream for. So, who is the one, what is the one person or character that has really given you confidence or inspired you to become what you want to be? Whether it be Batman, Superman, even someone in your personal life who maybe helped you come on up and be what you want to be? <laughs> you don't have to, there's no problem. Yeah. Absolutely not, no. I'm going to go with all right, I guess we'll go to the other universe then. We'll go with Marvel versus DC. <laughs> That's My too easy. That's too easy? I don't need to read either. You don't read either. Uh, well, we'll have to fix that sometime. Okay, I'll do Marvel versus hey. DC. All right. Personally, I believe uh, both Marvel and DC have their own individual merits. Uh, I view DC as kind of having a, the iconic pantheon of classic superheroes, um, kind of that uh, kind of stand uh, above the almost common mortals. Whereas Marvel has uh, they, their characters are much more almost down to earth and have flaws that you can see in. Uh, that more common man struggles with Tony Stark as an alcoholic, Daredevil's blind, um, whereas Clark Kent doesn't necessarily have those kind of issues. Um, but it, they ch um, have different kind of challenges that they have to overcome. Whereas uh, the DC, I find that most of their challenges are, to some degree, uh, oh, they're. Outside sources almost, whereas a lot of uh, Marvel characters kind of have internal struggles, more so I'd say. But I do enjoy both series, uh, both brands, uh, quite a bit. Although I believe that Marvel's accomplishing uh, handling their movie slash uh, TV universe uh, in a much more uh, it's a better plan. It's a better fashion. <laughs> All right. Nice. this wonderful world of public speaking. You've now been christened, and you're welcome to a Toastmaster meeting at any time. I'm going to pass it back to Amanda here. Thank you. No, good job to our volunteers, because that's, that's not easy, and I imagine that when you were coming up here, you probably had butterflies in your stomach, you probably, your mouth probably started feeling dry, your heart was pounding, and the real way to get over those feelings of nervousness is to do it, and to do it lots, and that's what a Toastmasters Club gives you the opportunity to do. So we have five minutes left, and wanted to make sure we left time for you guys to ask questions if you had any about, um, for any of us personally, for uh, about Toastmasters in general, any questions you might have for us. Go ahead, our teacher. How do you, how do you join Toastmasters? That's an easy question. <laughs> Well, leave it to the public relations office. Send me an email. Thank you. No, it's actually pretty simple to join Toastmasters. Like I said, there's over 100 clubs in the city, so we can find one that's close to your house or your place of work, depending on what best suits you. Um, the fees are usually pretty reasonable. They range between $100 a year to $250 a year. 
and you go as much as or often as you want. Most clubs meet weekly, but if you can't go weekly, then you go as often as you can. Go ahead, another one. Uh, well, when you do join, you're not just thrown into the water, are you? No. <laughs> it just no. seems a little bit... It's you know. totally go at your own pace. Um, John mentioned that there's manuals that you follow. The manuals have speech projects in them, and it's totally up to you how fast you want to do them. No one's going to say, hey, your turn to speak this week. Totally up to you. And one of the reasons we're all nervous to get up and speak is because we're worried the audience is judging us. Or we're worried we're going to flub our words and become a puddle on the floor, right? The nice thing about a Toastmasters club, it is, is it, sorry, it's 100% safe and encouraging and everyone's in it together and it is the perfect place to practice and get used to it and not feel like you're going to be judged, not feel like you're going to embarrass yourself and it's go at your own pace and no one's going to pressure you. Terry, can you speak to your own topics? If there's something I could quickly say, I've often wondered why does it work so well, it's because people are competing against themselves. I've been on a number of volunteer groups and uh, there's still that problem there where you see people competing against each other like they do at work. But in Toastmasters, everyone is willing to help you, coach you, and mentor you because everyone is competing against themselves and everyone's at different levels. And everyone else respects that. So that's why it's so relaxed and positive results. And we have a lot of fun doing it too. Not only that, um, I actually have our first manual right in front of me. The first speech is titled The Icebreaker. It's just a quick four to six minute speech about you. What do you want people to know about you? It doesn't matter what the topic is, as long as you can work it into one of these manuals. The great thing is, is it's structured in such a way that everything builds on the previous manual. So first one is just getting comfortable with public speaking. You're the subject matter expert of yourself. You know yourself better than anyone else. It's easy to speak about yourself. In fact, everybody loves doing it especially Toastmasters. But from there, you build on working on things like vocal variety in speech six. Speech nine, you're working on trying to get people enrolled in your vision or your idea of what your speech is about. And everything just builds on each other until you're done in the first 10 speeches. Then you get into advanced stuff where you can do five speeches on storytelling or other things. And you can cater it to whatever your needs are. You can even do technical presentations, so you can use it great in your job. And that's what it's all about. And yes, Toastmasters is 100% safe. I mean, I spoke about Battlestar Galactica in the middle of a Toastmasters meeting. I spoke, I did a speech on Ogopogo. You know, the, the, really the sky is the limit for everybody. And it's all in designing a safe way for you to do so without fear of recrimination or fear of anything because we're all in the same boat. We're all here to help each other together. Uh, if I provide you feedback, it's because I want to see you grow and see you develop yourself, as I would hope that you would do to me as well. And that's what it's really all about. Does anyone else have a question? For the panel? Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm just curious uh, to know, again, what kind of brings people to Toastmaster and also um, is it I guess I'm looking for normalcy of uh, different skill sets in public speaking and whether Toastmaster could help a person that kind of has these these moments of, of positive you know feeling that that moment where they can speak and then other moments they just totally feel like they can say a word, even though they might even know something about the topic, but all of a sudden it's like they've lost their voice. One, 100%, uh, you hit it kind of on the nail. I joined it because I needed to do something to improve my own self-confidence and stand up. And I do still go blank when I'm asked a question. That's why we do kind of things like table topics is to help you kind of stop, pause, and restate the question. Now every club has their own makeup of members. So some members are very, very experienced and some are, are not. But it depends on which club you go to because there is newer clubs and there is older clubs. And there's also advanced clubs, which me and Terry are a member of. And out of our advanced club alone, there's not what, one person, that, there's what, three people that don't have the distinguished Toastmaster. So when we do evaluations, we're pretty hard on each other. But in normal clubs, they're not. 
So if you fumble through your speech and you have your notes in front of you, which I still have my notes in front of me on most spe on some speeches, because you can't memorize it. And part of it is we help you realize where to take that pause, to maybe step back, look at your notes, come back, and present. So we'll help walk you through that. But it's you get out of it what you put into it. So if you want to learn those skills, then that's what you tell maybe your evaluator. You know, I want you to watch out for this particular thing that I seem to be doing. Not only will they do that with speech objectives, but they'll do that with on the side as well. Like I can share with you a very personal experience. Uh, we chartered the sh the Toastmasters Club within Shaw Communications about four years ago. And I decided I'd be smart, and I was a go-getter. And I figured, you know what, we're going to have our big charter party warming. And I'm going to do a speech in front of the highest guys within the district for Toastmasters. So I'm talking our Lieutenant Governor of Marketing, our go District Governor for all of Alberta and Saskatchewan. I'm going to do a speech in front of them. So I did a five to seven minute speech. And in that five to seven minute speech, I used the word basically 37 times. One of them actually counted that, and they came to me and they provided me with that feedback. I wouldn't have known that otherwise. Luckily, I had someone videotaping it and I watched it a little later, but the point of the matter is, is that's the kind of feedback you get. Because if, if no one would have shared that with me, I could be doing that all the time. And that's not what we want to do. We want to really help you develop when to use the ands, so's, and that, like to get rid of them. Um, and basically go back to how do you actually communicate. I was actually on the verge of almost getting let go from Shaw because my communication skills were considered detrimental to business. Because my heart was always in the right place, but the way that I communicated it, things to people wasn't the right way. And it came to do or die, like you either fix this or you're gone. And at that point in time, I had actually just gotten my confidence level started up with Toastmasters, and then I had to go back to the drawing board, and, and these guys helped me through that, of trying to get myself into the point where my communication skills are exactly where I want them to be. And without these guys, I would <coughs> probably be there still today. I think if I could add something very quickly. My time is up there. After I received my first level, I really honestly didn't think I was speaking that much better, but I did know that I was a lot more relaxed. And that's a big first step, is just being relaxed when you speak. Thanks, guys. So we're out of time, but we do have magazines if you want to Toastmaster magazine, and we'll hang out the doors if you want to ask questions. Not in front of everyone, we'll, we'll hang around for a few minutes to ask one. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. Don't miss something away from you. You've been a great call. It's a great call. I'm here to talk. I'm here to talk. I'm here to talk.